Good morning. We appreciate you taking time out of your day to join us for this webinar. Before we get started, I just want to cover a few housekeeping items. This webinar is produced by the Underserved Victim Populations Training Project, a project of the Center for Innovation and Resources. Funding for this project comes from the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services Victim Services Branch, with funding made possible through the United States Department of Justice Victims of Crime. For those of you who can hear me, this might seem obvious, but I just want to remind everyone to turn on their speakers in order to hear the presentation. You can use the Q&A feature to ask the presenter any questions that you may have. The chat panel is where you can ask tech support questions, which will be answered immediately. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter, Rex Sheridan. Rex Sheridan is the Clinical Director of San Pasqual Academy, a program in North County, San Diego, serving adolescents and transitional age youth in a residential education program. He has 17 years of experience working with various youth and TAY populations and 13 years in a management role, which includes providing professional development training to parents, educators, staff, volunteers, and mental health providers. He holds an MA in Marriage and Family Therapy from Fuller School of Psychology and is a licensed marriage and family therapist. Now, please bear with me a moment while I switch the controls over to Rex. All right, does it look like we're up and running there, Emma? Perfect, yes. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be with you this morning. Uh, I know that these are unique times. I'm sure all of you, like myself, are getting used to doing work and training and, and everything else in a different way. So thank you for joining us this morning. Um, it's a privilege to be with you. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Tay populations for uh, the better part of a couple decades now, and uh, I've, I've had the chance to work in uh, mental health settings, school settings, um, with caregivers, with educators, uh, with other professionals. And, and so it's such a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, just a few things to start off as an introduction. Um, just wanted to say that I'm, I'm humbled to, to be here with many of you. There's so many of you, as I looked at the list, that have a variety of experiences out there. And um, usually in tra trainings, when they get to be live, I'm able to learn and take a lot from the, the audience as well. But um, thank you so much for all the work that you do, especially during this time when uh, there's already challenges for our Tay youth and now um, even more so during, during these times. So just wanted to take the opportunity to thank you for uh, each and everything that you do. Um, also wanted to talk about the fact that this is a 90 minute presentation and actually the last 15 will be more questions. Um, so Obviously, we're just doing some overview. Um, hopefully for all of you, there will be things within this presentation that are review and good reminders. Um, but also, I'm hoping that there's some things that we've added that can be um, really nice addition to uh, what, what, you're, what you're doing. Um, the slides will be available. So I like to tell you that at the very beginning, because I know that there's sometimes some very meticulous note takers. And I'd love for you to just be able to engage and listen and know that you'll, you'll be able to have all of the slides um, afterwards uh, and, and kind of look through them at your convenience. Um, just a little bit about the title, Discovering the Tay Way. Um, wanted to talk about the, the idea of discovering has been my journey in terms of working with um, this population. Uh, it's an ongoing discovering of, of how to work with them, how to understand, uh, and then also adapting to the changing of times um, as things change. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that in the presentation. Um, also, I wanted to say that there is, although the title says that, there is no one Tay way. Um, I just wanted to make note of that. There's a lot of ways to work with our Tay, and um, there's so many individual differences and diversity amongst um, this population. And so I just want to make sure that that, that was said, I'm not trying to say that there's one way, uh, but it was, it was a nice rhyme and something that we can uh, spend a little time on today. Uh, the information contained in this presentation is going to be from, you know, personal experience, res uh, the research that's out there, um, and other trainings that, that uh, I've had a chance to, to go to, and then just in general practice. 
but a lot of it's also from trial and error, um, just making the mistakes that we all make working out there and then trying to adjust as needed. Um, so with that, that's a little bit of an overview. Uh, thank you for being here. I, uh, I got a nice uh, fresh shave today, knowing that there was gonna be a close up on my face. So uh, let's dive in and start. Um, I wanted to first start with a little uh, activity. So what I'd like you to do is just look at the screen that I'm sharing with you and I'll give you just a second and I'd like you to um, tell me how many squares that you see. Just take a moment to look at that picture and just tell me how many squares you think you see. We've got 16, 17, 20, 18, oh, 27, a good variety, <laughs> 30. Yeah, okay. Those are all great answers. And the great thing about this uh, slide is that those are all correct. Um, and that's the purpose of this activity. If I had you live, I'd be having you in groups and kind of sharing with each other while, why you saw how many you saw. Um, but the reason for this activity is to say that um, there's a lot of different right answers to this question. And actually the purpose of the activity isn't to come up with the right answer. It's more to demonstrate the fact that we, what's more important than finding out what the right answer is, is understanding the perspective of someone else, understanding how they see it and why they have the, the, the number in their head that they do. Um, and that it comes into place so much when we work with our Tay, um, because sometimes they have very, very different and unique perspectives about the world, about life, about relationships. And it's not our job to necessarily tell them what the right answer is. It's, help, it's to help us walk through their perspective and really help understand that. And the idea of um, seeking to understand, not just to be understood, and also the idea that um, you can be right, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to be wrong. And I think that that's so important um, in, in the work with our, our Tay. Um, just to, just to kind of have fun with this a little bit, for those who put all over the map what it could be, I've, I've had answers anywhere from 1 to 31. Um, and you could say 1 just because you see one big square in the middle. You can say 16 because there's 16 of these same size squares. Um, if you look at my cursor, you can call a square the, the, the four part ones, the quad, or the three box ones like that. Those are all squares. So that's how you can get to 30. I wanted to share with you a story about when my daughter was eight. Um, you know, I thought I had done this training enough and heard all the answers you could give. And I, I thought that the most you could possibly say is, of squares was, uh, was 30. And she said, no, no, dad, there's 31. There's another one. And I said, no, I don't, no, I don't think so, honey. And she said, well, yeah, look at the word at the top that says squares. And that just really opened my eyes again to just when we sometimes think that we've been through and understand it all, um, sometimes it's that humility to just understand somebody else can see one more thing that we, we didn't see. So anyways, the other thing I wanted to say about the activities that we have built into this training is please feel free to use these. Um, that can be a really helpful activity with other coworkers. Uh, with the Tay that you work with, um, just to kind of understand perspectives. So just to dive in a little bit, we want to do a short um, little review of a few de developmental models. There are so many of these that, that and that's not the purpose of this presentation to go through a thorough review, but I wanted to point out a few that might be helpful in terms of working with Tay. So you've got um, Erickson's Stage theory, this was developed a long time ago. We got uh, over half a century of, of work on this. Um, but if you look down here in this range of the adolescence and early adulthood, that would cover the Tay range. And we've got these two um, developmental phases where you're going through where the, the conflict is intimacy versus isolation for the older uh, Tay youth and identity versus role confusion uh, for for the younger ones. And just the idea that, that that's a stage where they're really exploring identity, uh, who they are, what they're all about, what they're loyal to and what they stand for. Um, and then also exploring relationships and who they're gonna be in relationships, who, where their belonging is gonna come from and, and looking at intimacy. 
Another, another one is moral development. Um, this may not be as widely known, but um, this was developed by a uh, man named Kohlberg. And what it is, is it gives six stages of moral development. And so much of what we work with with our, our Tay has to do with their decisions around uh, morality and, and understanding this is different than, uh, you know, religious beliefs or spirituality, things like that, but moral development. And so walking through this, it's just a basic understanding of stage one is kind of uh, making decisions based on avoiding punishment. Stage two is when you're doing something for some kind of gain or reward. Um, stage three is actually doing something because it makes you look like a good person. Um, and you're a, you're a good boy, good girl. Now with genders, we need to ex expand that to all genders. Um, and then stage four, doing what is right because it's kind of your duty to do so, just being a good citizen or a good member of, of a group or a community. Um, where we start to see some of our um, Tay get into in the age that we work with them is stage five and six where doing what is right and really even if it's against the law and sometimes even because it is against the law, um, being able to uh, make decisions based on more of a higher moral compass and then stage six, doing it because you've really internalized those, those values of justice and, um, and morality. And we're seeing that so much even right now with, with all of the activism, uh, with all of the work around social justice and those, those issues and racial justice issues. And um, so just wanted to point out, this is an age group where that's really being explored. And then we've got emerging adulthood, which is a newer term, it's definitely, happened since the turn of the century and that's a man named Jeffrey Arnett kind of coined the term but it's this idea that we see where um, now things have really changed for this age group whereas uh, you know in the in the earlier part of last century uh, most the, the ages where people got married where people had kids was so much earlier and even by the the early 20s um, they were starting with stable you know, with, with earning incomes, with their career job, things like that. And now we, we've had so many changes with the economy, uh, with social changes, um, that now it's extended that period of adolescence um, and, and that emerging adulthood. So that there's this coined term that, you know, obviously we don't just, when we turn 18, uh, take on all the rights and responsibilities of an adult anymore. Um, and in fact, our society isn't really set up that way anymore because there's there's a push for continued education, um, all those things. So you have this period that goes on where it's it's uh, delayed a little bit the start of families, career, jobs, all those kinds of things. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to do that. Um, but there's five areas: identity exploration, um, instability, self-focus feeling of being in between and a sense of broad possibilities that kind of mark this time. Um, some of the things listed below there in terms of the impact, um, there's increased options for this age group. Um, you know, some people choose to explore more education, some people travel, some people, you know, co-live, co cohabitate, all those kinds of things. Um, but there's so many options but also there's increased pressure for income, especially living in California where the standard of living is, is so high. Um, some residential instability where there's constant movements in, uh, in where they're living. And then uh, increased dependency. So a longer period of time for those Tay that may have the, the fallback of being with a caregiver or somebody who can support them during that time, um, there are oftentimes is more dependency and not taking over the full rights and responsibilities of adulthood. Um, but many of the Tay that we work with, obviously, I recognize this population doesn't have that fallback, doesn't have that buffer. So we're, some of the services we're providing are exactly that, helping to fill in that gap and support them through this, this time. Then we got some brain stuff. Now we could do a whole presentation and I have done that on, on the brain. It's, a, it's kind of a pet project of mine. I didn't really get any brain training um, in my schooling, um, but I've kind of, um, my family even teases me that it's, it's, it's something that I 
always read about and talk about now because it's so fascinating what's been done. Um, but you can see just looking at what the Tay brain looks like and what parts are under development, how, how much they, they still, it's not really up until the age of uh, the mid twenties that we're pretty much fully developed with our, with our brain. And that's the end of, the, of that Tay time. So just wanted to point that out that we're really under construction up until that time. We're gonna talk about some of the areas that we're under construction in. So diving into that, I want to talk a little bit about the brain just to spend a few minutes and specifically the stress systems, because we see a lot of this as we work with um, our Tay. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to hold up my hand. I would encourage you to follow me along with your hand because it helps kind of set this learning uh, for you. So uh, our brain. So it's intended to be a brain that looks like this, tight, connected, interconnected. Um, so this, this area in our wrist and palm that comes up, this, is, this would be like the model of our brain stem. And this has a very, this has all the parts that are kind of unconscious that we don't have to think about that affect our body and, and the, just the, the breathing, the, the heat regulation, all those kinds of things. Um, but it has a very important area in it called the amygdala. And the amygdala really um, is, picks up all of its information from, from the senses in the body and really is the one that has to do with our stress system and, and activates our stress response. Um, it picks up on when there's threats to us and then it responds accordingly. The thumb is kind of the midbrain or um, our limbic system. And this is our emotional center. This is where we have all of our big feelings and emotions. Um, but obviously when you think about the emotions that we have that are tied to memories, there's a strong connection between our memories and our emotions. So this area crosses over both sides of the, the brain and it's this primary concern of this part is um, seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. And then we've got the fingers that come down over the top and this would represent uh, the forebrain, the part that you usually see when you look at the model of a brain. And the most important, or the, the most active part of this is right behind the nose here, there's a little area called the prefrontal cortex. And that area controls so much of what makes us human, of what gives us that higher level thinking. I listed much of it here. Um, and one of the things I wanted to point out is that this part develops later in our lives um, and, and actually develops into our 20s. It, it continues throughout the lifespan. So that's why you have older populations, you know, are encouraged to take on new experiences, to to do crossword puzzles, to, to swim, to do things that activate because it continues to need to stay sharp. But what I wanna point out is that this does continue to, to develop through this Tay period and primarily it develops through relationships. Um, and that is so important because the, the roles that we have in our Tay's life and the relationship that we have, what we model, um, how we come across, how we communicate, those are things that, that work at the molecular level to help develop their brain and help set them up to be ready for um, the challenges of adulthood. So I just want to encourage you that no matter what role you have, um, that part of what you do is so important and, and the relationship you have with them is so important. Not just the task that you get done with them, but the relationship between you. So here's just some of the, the functions of the prefrontal cortex. As you look through that list, I'm sure that it covers most of the areas where you work with Tay, where you um, negotiate, you have insight, you build empathy, um, develop morality, adjusting their behavior and planning. So many of those things are exactly what we're working on uh, with them. Um, whether you're a parent or caregiver, whether you're a mental health professional, um, in law enforcement, uh, what, an educator, these are the areas that we're really trying to develop. So talking a little bit about um, flipping our lids. So if we have a, a brain that's supposed to be tight like this, and this is when we're fully functional and active, what happens with stress and then even more with trauma is uh, it, this, in a sense, this smoke detector gets set off. So we, we sense a threat um, to us, something that is stressful. The emotional pressure starts to build underneath here. And this thumb is trying to put pressure against the fingers. And there's all these chemicals, catecholamines and others that are released when we have this stress reaction. They're putting more pressure and making it harder and harder for my fingers to hold down 
and hold in place this system. And the upstairs brain, this area right here, tries to calm it down. But sometimes, especially when this isn't developed yet, we pop our lid and our, our tay pop their lid. And what happens in that is obviously literally our brain doesn't come off the stem, but, but we lose the connection between the thinking and rational part of our brain and the part that is activated emotionally. And so some of those higher level abilities to think and reason are lost. And that's why sometimes when we talk to our tay during that time, it seems very unreasonable, very flippant, um, not able to kind of engage in that process. And we really have to wait for the body and that and the emotions to calm down to be able to have a, a, a better reaction. Um, and it does calm down in two different ways. Either it calms itself down, and that will happen through the skills that Ate has learned to be able to manage this, or um, it happens by connecting with someone else who has that control, and they kind of tap into that self-control and regulation. Sometimes we play that part, and then sometimes we're trying to develop that within them so they can do that for themselves. Just a few things here listed about how we kind of get a grip and control ourselves. You see that guy hanging off that cliff. Um, that's so amazing. I can to do that with one hand and to be able to hold that position. But the idea that no matter how strong, no matter how developed our regulation is, nobody can hold that position and hold that grip forever. And so the importance of keeping all of our fingers strong, because if even one finger is lifted off of that and not able to hold on, we're, we're, we're gonna lose our grip. And so just, just looking down the five fingers there um, that, that are kind of representing how we keep a grip, our body, um, you know, there's some days when we just know we're not feeling our best. And this goes for our Tay to help them learn that and how to support themselves. And also for us, as we work a very stressful and sometimes challenging job, we can lose our grip. So are we connected and are we aware of how our body is doing? Um, our mindset, uh, whether we're in relationships that are supportive to us and, and helping us through this time. Um, what's our level of insight? Are we building our insight through all of you are by attending trainings and learning as, as, you, as you learn, but how are you developing your insight and your self-reflection? And then staying connected to your purpose. Why did you end up uh, being in this role in the first place? How what was, what's your purpose? What's your vision? Is there, is there a bigger picture to that? And when you are disconnected from that, it's very hard to do this work. When you're connected to that, it's so important. All right, so jumping into some strategies for communication. All right, so another little uh, challenge here. I'd like you to think about um, a song, a piece of music that you either really like or you really don't like. And maybe list it, send it back in the, in the chat here. And what would happen if you took the music out of that and it was just the lyrics? What would, what would happen to the meaning of that song? So I'll take a, a minute to, to let you respond. So as you're thinking and writing back, um, so a couple that I thought of um, for, for me is, uh, you know, the, the song, and this will date me a little bit, but don't worry, be happy. So you got, you know, do, 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 do. So you got this great music, but then you got these very simple lyrics of, uh, don't worry, be happy, don't worry, be happy. And when I say it that way, it's so bland, it's so, it's so ridiculous, and it almost sounds like a, a cliche. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a great, great song when you add the music to it and, you, and it even affects you at that molecular level. When you hear that song, it just kind of puts you in a relaxing state. Um, I see some others coming up here. Brown Eyed Girl. That's a great one. There's, there's so many out there, many of the Beatles songs, just simple lyrics, but the way that the music impacts it is incredible. Um, another one that kind of can affect things the other way. Um, uh, there was a song, Pumped Up Kicks, a while ago. And, you know, one time I heard my wife singing it, and she was just singing along, everything like that. And, and I told her, I was like, have you ever thought about the lyrics to that song? You know, all the other kids with the pumped up kicks, you better run, better run, outrun my gun. And, you know, the song is partially about a, a shooting, I think a school shooting. 
Um, and yet the lyrics or the music that they put to it makes it so happy, so, so singable, um, so catchy. Um, and it's so interesting how the music behind the lyrics gives context and meaning. And that's the same way that it works with what we say um, to our, our Tay. Um, we can sometimes have all the right words, but if the, the music behind it, the context, the body language, the eye contact, as I listed here, facial expressions, tone of voice, that can give, make all the difference in terms of the meaning and how it lands on them. And I just want to encourage you to really pay attention to that right brain communication, that part that is not about the words, but about how we're saying things, not what we say, but how we say, how we say it. It's just so important and it makes such a, a difference. So another idea here is about the writing reflex. Um, now this is an idea um, that came out of motivational interviewing. It's a term that they coined. Um, and as you look down that kind of uh, description that I gave, all those words, correct, fix, give advice, persuade, cajole, prod, inform. The fact that I could find those so easily and I probably could have come up with a couple dozen more shows that we have this push inside of us to correct to try to fix when, so when we see something wrong, when we see something we're worried about, when there's a concern, we wanna fix it. And that's a reflex we have, almost like the girl in the picture that, that it's just an instinct we kick. We really have to fight that reflex when we work with Tay. You know, they're at the age where they really wanna make their own choices, they wanna come up with their own ideas. And it's so powerful when we're able to help them explore their ideas, help them consider and reflect and come up with their determinations on their own. Um, but when we come in and just weigh in really quick and share with them, we don't think that's a good decision or do this differently. Sometimes we actually um, shoot ourselves in the foot and it goes the opposite way because they can sometimes to spite, just make a different decision. And so it's so important to, to fight that writing reflex. Of course, there are times when we need to try to give advice and help but really paying attention to how we do that and if we're able to help empower them through that process. Some of the problems with the writing reflex is that true lasting change comes when it's more internally motivated. Um, oftentimes when we get caught up in the writing reflex, we end up working harder than they do. So if there's something that needs to be done, we end up doing all the work on it and then being Sometimes if we're honest, bitter and frustrated and resentful that we did all the work on something in their life that doesn't seem like they care about. Um, and that can sometimes be frustration at them, but it's really oftentimes comes back to us setting the boundaries around not doing that work for them. Um, and then the idea that we, you truly build self-esteem and confidence and confidence when you do your own problem solving decision making. I think if you think about the Tay you work with, when they've really been able to work through a challenge, even if it was rough, um, and they were able to come to a conclusion and follow through on it, there's so much value that's built there in terms of their self-esteem and confidence. Um, and then just the idea, I put a boat in the background because it's kind of the metaphor that I like to think about. If, if, I, if I'm in a rowboat and I take a really strong opinion, it's like jumping on one side of the boat and, and automatically, if I do that, the other person has to jump on the other side to balance it out or else we're both going in the water. And I think that's kind of how it is in communication and in, in the work sometimes. If we jump too far on that side of the boat, we take it too strong of an opinion, they automatically take the opposite one. And so just paying attention to that is important. All right, um, most of you have probably heard of ORs. Um, it's an acronym for open-ended questions, affirmations, reflections, and summaries. Um, I'm going to assume that most of you know what those are, even if you haven't heard of the acronym. Um, but what I'd like to do is make sure that we extend um, the meaning and talk about the, using the best possible ones versus just the basics. So open-ended questions, the value of those are just to open up conversation and not get one word answers, but really to extend conversation. Um, so I put there, good ones create a longer response, but the best ones lead to self-reflection. So yes, you can get a long way by just asking questions open-ended, but when we ask it in a way that, um, that leads to self-reflection, that it really has them thinking about, okay, what do I really think about this? Um, those are the best ones. 
in terms of affirmations, uh, the idea of praising or affirming the, the Tay that we work with, it's so important to do that. Good ones sound like a compliment, which is very important and helpful, but the best ones are specific and unique. Um, you know, I think that's so important um, to make them specific and unique to that person because it personalizes it, it helps create a connection, and it's not just good jobbing somebody, it's really pointing out what they did and the reason for that affirmation. Uh, reflections. So reflection, basically, like you're, like you're looking in a mirror, it's a way of helping someone to, to understand how you saw or perceived what they said or how they came across. So good ones will, will demonstrate that I heard you. Um, the best ones say I know you. So the idea that when we really give reflections, getting past just I heard what you said, but I really get what you're saying. I get where you're coming from. And if I don't, I'm asking more questions to try to understand where you're coming from. And then finally, summaries. Good ones cover the main points. So it's the idea if someone's talked to you about something, you really want to summarize it at the end to show that you, you've listened and you've kind of gotten what they said. And good ones cover the main points, but the best ones succinctly link themes together. So if you've really heard some strong themes coming out, oftentimes when somebody's talked about something, they might not for instance, be aware of their emotions about it. So if we give a summary at the end saying, you know, yeah, it really seems like that's confusing. Um, and it really seems like because it's confusing, it's leading to um, not knowing what choice to make. That can really help connect us with them and, they, and, and actually help them connect with themselves about things that they may not realize. Body language. Have some fun pictures in here. <laughs> Um, I'm not going to spend time on this whole uh, slide and all the, all the pieces of it, um, but just to point out that this, so this slide just is a combination of a lot of books around um, body language and all the different parts of our bodies that can reflect certain things. Just to give an example, you know, I'm sitting here looking at you, I'm trying to, to lean a little bit forward and, and show that interest and that engagement. Um, if I was sitting here, and I'll back up a little bit, and I um, was... Had my, had my arms crossed um, and things like that. That conveys there's actually something in between me and you. Um, that's, that's a little bit of a disconnection. And while I might not mean they convey that, um, sometimes that's what others are picking up on it. And body language can, can be so important. Um, and even when you think you've read up and you get all the different things and you're doing body language the right way, the crazy part about it is culturally, and you know, diversity-wise, body language can mean different things to different people. So in, in our culture, oftentimes in American, um, you know, maybe Anglo culture, watching, looking at someone directly in the eyes is, is something that conveys respect. Um, doing that in, in an Asian American, uh, with an Asian American may convey the opposite. It's a, chal it's a challenge or it's confrontational and, and your eyes may supposed to be down. So, we have to pay attention to cultural factors. We have to pay attention to, um, you know, our body language, but just the idea that this is so important. And this is really a lot of the, the music behind our lyrics. Um, I'd like to give you a little homework assignment with this slide, which is that, and I think while it's hard, it will really, really impact the work that you do and your awareness. I'd like you to pick the person that's closest to you, um, whether it's a, a, a partner, um, a spouse, a best friend, a, a brother, sister, but somebody who you really feel like knows you and you're confident no, no, matter, no matter what, they're going to be there for you. And ask them, what are my annoying body language habits? What do I do that's annoying? And tell, give them permission to be honest with you. Tell them you're not going to say anything. And once you ask that question, zip your lip. Don't argue with it. Don't defend it. No matter how ridiculous it sounds like what they say, just listen to it and then thank them at the end. And consider that because there's so much of what we do that we don't realize and that is, we're blind to. And if the people that are close to you, they know. And I guarantee all of you have something because um, I know I did. Uh, when I asked my wife this, uh, she told me about my RBF, right? Which I, uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, the resting bitch face. So I really have to intentionally try to um, smile and do that because my natural face is something that looks like I'm too serious or angry. So it's important um, to be aware of those things because they can convey a lot. A little bit about humor. Um, so 
I'm not going to talk about this whole slide. There's a bunch of different kinds of humor there. I really want to draw attention to that first one of self-deprecation um, because that's the one in my career in talking with others and doing a lot of um, supervision and, and consulting with others. I found that that's the one that's the safest and usually um, humanizes and makes us the most relatable. When we can laugh at ourselves, when we can make fun of ourselves, when we can point to some of our idiosyncrasies, it really helps to um, have us be seen as humble, as someone who's self-aware, as someone who's not prideful. And especially for our Tay, that can be such a connecting point when they see that we're we're honest with our weaknesses and we can be vulnerable and we can laugh at ourselves and they're going through so much and so much they have to sh you know, show on the outside that they have it together, but that can really be relatable when we do that. So I just wanted to encourage you to use that one. Some of the other ones like sarcasm and mim mimicking and things like that, those can be really dangerous, especially at the points where they're stressed or we don't know how they're taking things. Those can sometimes be intended to relate to them, but end up um, creating some distance there. So humor can be really helpful. It's also one of those things that can sometimes uh, fuel dissension or, or create a, a problem with a relationship. So just wanted to point to that and how important that is. All right. A little bit about um, the, the shifting of roles. So I want to talk about before I dive into these next few slides, um, the fact that in a very short period of time during that Tay age range, um, we go all the way through this series of roles that we might play in their lives, all the way from many times early on in that, controlling most of what they do and most of what's going on, um, all the way to not even really having much of an impact or not being more of a a person on the side that, that supports them through something, but that isn't directly making any decisions anymore. And that's a hard process for us to go through, with, especially those caregivers, those people that have the deep relationships. But for any of us, it can sometimes be hard to adjust to losing control. And for Arte, it's a hard process too, because they want the independence, they want that control, they want to take charge of their lives, but oftentimes maybe they're not quite ready to make some of those decisions, or they're not making good decisions. And Again, we go back to that writing reflex of wanting to um, support them through that, but how do we do that? So these next few slides are gonna talk about that. Um, so the first position that we can be in is the driver. So you've got, you know, I think of this picture and I don't know if this is true, but uh, a father and a son, he's driving him around. It looks like everybody's happy, everything's under control. Um, the dad's making the decisions and in control of the whole situation. Um, and that oftentimes is where we start with our youth, in, or, or with Arte, and sometimes uh, Arte even try to put us in that position because they want, they don't want to be the driver. They want somebody else to make the decision, someone else to be in control. And that can be a catch-22. Sometimes that means that better decisions are made and, the, and things go smoother in the, in the, in the beginning, um, but oftentimes down the road that can also mean that they haven't learned how to make their own decisions or they even blame us for the decisions that go bad. Um, so we, that's, that's a really important role, but one that we have to be careful of. The next one is the passenger. So you've got a daughter here, or the way that I picture it, a daughter and a, a mom. The mom's in the passenger seat now, and she's still directing, pointing out um, where to go, maybe what to do while she's driving. But um, in the end, she's not in full control. The girl makes the final decision is in, in the control, but she has a very active role. Next slide is a backseat driver. And I laugh at this one because obviously I have to put together these slides and find these pictures. And I could literally not find a picture of a, a, a Tay or a youth driving and a parent in the back. Because right, a, a caregiver, a parent or a support figure usually doesn't take that role. They're not gonna sit in the back because you have even less control and less influence and you're kind of there for the ride. And so you see in the background there that, that, that person, that adult, pointing out, scared, worried, um, and, and the reaction of the, the youth in the front, um, just nervous and, and almost annoyed that that's the response. And sometimes that can be our position. We're in the back seat. We don't even have an active role anymore, but we're still in the car. We're still helping them make decisions. We're still there, but their influence has drastically been reduced. And then finally, we have the consultant. So now you've got, in my mind, the, the, the dad, Outside the car, the, the son just pulled up. He's checking in with dad. 
uh, maybe the dad's given some advice, but has no control of what happens when he's driving. He's just there to uh, give some advice and help out and cross his fingers and hope that things go well. And sometimes that's the position we have is we're not having any influence. We're not there with them. We're not making those decisions, but they do seek us out from time to time as a consultant. So I wanted to walk through those, those four roles and also point out that, it's, that that's a, it's a very short period of time where someone goes through from having someone be the driver in their lives to being the driver and having that person even no longer in the car making those decisions. So the question I wanted to pose to you um, is which one of those four in your role with Tay do you find yourself most commonly in? Or are you rotating between them on a, comp on a constant basis? I'll give you a minute to respond to that. And I just, um, I just launched the poll, Rex, so I'll, it'll be able to show the answers in just a minute here. Great. Thank you so much, Emma. So as you're responding to that, just kind of pointing out that, uh, and I see, I see some of the things coming in, yes. Um, oftentimes, it, probably the most common response is going to be that we go between these roles so often. And I don't want to point out that, that one role is more important than the other, or that we all should be at the point of being consultants if we work with the older Tay or anything like that. Really, the reality is, is oftentimes we're rotating in and out of these positions based on the need. Sometimes we may have a Tay that's having a mental health crisis or some kind of a, a trauma, and they're not in the position mentally or psychologically to be able to make the big decisions. And so we step in and we may be in the driver's seat for a little bit. Um, but hopefully, uh, in the work we're doing, we're not pushing it towards the driver's seat. Oh, I see the responses there, so great, yes. Um, I see that consultant is probably the biggest role that we have, which is great, because that's where our, our Tay are making the decisions and learning those things. But it can also obviously be, be scary and nerve-wracking for us as we let go of some of that control and let them make those mistakes. Sometimes they're huge mistakes, life-changing mistakes, or not even mistakes, but life-changing decisions. And those are, um, those are hard things, but yes, we, we do rotate in and out of those roles. And this, this is also one that can be a helpful one to talk about with the Tay that you work with or the coworkers you work with, just to make sure that you aren't getting locked into one role and um, you, that you're able to adjust between them and even talking to your Tay about where do they see you? Um, do they see you in the passenger seat? Do they see you as a consultant? Where do they want you? Um, and where do you want to be? Those are helpful conversations to have. All right. Um, the, this, this is just a, a video I wanted to point out. Um, if you have the chance to watch it afterwards, Brene Brown is, is, a, is a great researcher. And the reason I love the work that she puts out is it's not just great research, but the way that she presents it, whether it's through a TED Talk or some of the, the interviews that she's done, has just been so incredible and relatable. And she breaks down very challenging and complicated concepts in such a user-friendly way. So I would encourage you to pretty much everything I've watched of her has been uh, remarkable and very helpful. Um, this is one on compassion and boundaries. And the reason that I'm um, recommending this one is because it, it talks about the connection between compassion. And we're going to talk about compassion fatigue in a minute. But the idea that um, the compassion we have is so important for the Tay that we work with. But if we don't set our boundaries, if we don't have boundaries and, and set those, that oftentimes that's one of the main things that can make our compassion um, limited. But when we set our boundaries and, we, and we're able to um, tell them what the limits are and where you know, where their role ends and begins in, in, in our lives and in theirs, that can be so important that in not having us go towards that bitterness, that, that fatigue, that burnout that, that happens when we take too much responsibility for their lives or when we, we allow there to be too loose of boundaries there in the relationship. So she has a great way of putting that way better than I ever could. Um, so I just encourage you to, to look that one up. It's easy to find on YouTube. So uh, compassion fatigue. I'm sure most of you have heard of that. You may have even been through a lot of training on this area. Um, but I wanted to 
point out that this is something we really need to pay attention to as, as we work with Tay, because anytime we're working with um, those in a very stressful situation, in traumatic situations, which is probably most of uh, the Tay that you're working with, we take on that second hand as well. Um, it's almost like being around secondhand smoke. Uh, we, we take that on whether we're intending to or not. And oftentimes it's a lot like boiling the frog in the water, right? I'm sure you've heard that analogy before, but if you put a frog in, in you know, um, room temperature water and then start boiling it, they don't even notice that they're gonna boil to death. Um, and that's how compassion fatigue has been in my life and in my experience is that I, I don't necessarily want to admit or don't see that it's there, but when I'm not aware of it, it creeps up. And then I start seeing it come out in my responses with my family, with my kids at home, um, my wife, my, uh, my personal relationships. I start um, getting, getting tired, more irritable, more negative um, oftentimes. And I'm sure some of you can relate with that or maybe have that show up in a different way, but there's consequences for working with, with those that suffer from trauma and that are under a lot of stress. And we have names for it, secondary trauma, vicarious trauma, burnout, but that's something we, we wanna pay attention to. Um, so part of this is, th these are all the things around uh, this person there that, that talk about some of the things that happen with compassion fatigue. And I really want you to look through those and connect with those because I'm almost assured that if you are, have been working for any length of time with Tay in any of the roles that you have, that, that some of these things are things that you've faced and experienced. And for some of you, you hopefully you were aware of those things. Maybe you knew what they were. Uh, for, for a lot of us, sometimes we don't see them coming and we don't recognize they're there. And we can even sometimes feel ashamed, guilty, or like there's something wrong with us when they show up. And I just want to put those out there because these are truly things that are just a natural part of work going through a lot of trauma. And so just kind of wanted to point that out. Um, these are things important to talk about in your teams, in your uh, staff meetings, um, wherever you work with, with your possibly with the Tay that you work with, but making sure that you have a support system and you talk about these things. You don't want to feel isolated and alone on an island and, and burn out in the important work you do because you're not aware of, of these things going on. So again, this training isn't to go through all the ins and outs of that, but just to encourage you to really have a, a culture in your workplace, in, in, the, in the roles that you have um, of support somewhere to, to be honest and open about these things. And just a few um, considerations um, to simplify, how do we manage compassion fatigue? Uh, so the first area that's important is this laugh category, this idea of letting yourself have fun and play and find humor, uh, just so important in the work that we, we do. Um, looking down that, um, I think it's at many escapes in your day. I know that most of us are, are pressed for time and oftentimes don't have a lot, but maybe it's the walk. I know for me, I work on a campus. Um, maybe it's the walk from one place to another or the drive to, to work or the short space between uh, a meeting or a session. Um, being able to take that time to whatever your uh, position is in terms of being able to find those mini escapes. Some people will will meditate, some people will do the, do the breathing, some people engage in an activity that just helps um, them to calm down, um, prayer. Uh, for, there's different things for everyone, but just making sure you know what those are and doing those. Um, and then also using humor as a form of kindness to ourselves and others. We talked about self-deprecation before, but being able to laugh at ourselves, laugh at situations, so important to be able to get through that. Um, thinking. The next area, making sure our mindset is in the right place to avoid the compassion fatigue. Oftentimes with compassion fatigue, our thinking process, those, those rotating thoughts that are happening in our head that oftentimes are very negative and cynical, we need to be aware of those and try to make sure that we are adjusting those so that they're not too distorted and that they're not too negative and that we can, we can have a balanced view. Um, and then finally, the cry part. Um, and this isn't just, some of us don't cry. I like to tell people that 
I cry through my sweat glands. Um, one of the things that I learned a long time ago in doing this work is that when I work with Kay and I take on some of that trauma, I have to get it out physically. And so for me, I've learned that I have to have a very intense um, exercise or physical routine at the point where I'm laying in a pool of sweat at the end of it in the morning or in the evening because that helps get it out of me. That's how I cry. For some of you, you may actually cry. Some of you may cry through um, putting together a piece of music or um, you know, spending time being vulnerable with someone. There's lots of ways to do that. Um, but I just encourage you to have that um, at, your, at your disposal to try to do those things on a regular basis. Um, the other one I wanted to point out here is being honest with ourselves about our primary emotions so that we avoid the secondary ones. I'm sure this is the therapist part of me coming out, but so much of that comes up in all the counseling work that, that is done. And in so much of what we do is that, is that those primary emotions like fear and, you know, that those, the, deep, the deep fear and shame and guilt and things that we feel, oftentimes those are really hard things to admit and share about. Um, but if we don't and we're not aware of those things, they come out as secondary emotions, the anger, the jealousy, the frustration, the irritability. And so when we're able to be honest with ourselves and others about those underlying emotions, it actually makes us stronger, not weaker. All right, and then moving into the section on uh, Tay skills here. So um, emotional intelligence. Um, this is probably, you know, everybody knows about IQ. Most of you have probably learned about EQ. I don't, this could be a whole training, but just pointing out some of the ones on the, on the bottom here that are really active for our Tay. Um, Self-awareness, the ability to be reflective, um, to think about the choices we make, to think about who we are, to not just act on impulse, but to reflect. So important. Um, you know, some of the uh, educators and mental health professionals out there, the idea of learning mindfulness, whether that's through meditation, whether that's through just simple practices that can bring people back into the present moment rather than getting lost in the past or the future or other situations. Those skills are so, so important for, for their learning. Uh, the awareness of others and empathy. Um, you know, many of the Tay that we work with um, have had to survive for most of their lives. And they haven't necessarily had the luxury to think about others, to think about others because they've had to survive themselves. And you see so much resilience in so many of them that have, have had to care for siblings, have had to care for um, other people in that process. And many of them have, have very deep empathy. But sometimes that empathy needs to be developed a little bit. And so the idea of awareness for others' needs, and they're at that age where they're learning how to be in relationship. And really, a lot of times, the, the permanency and the quality of their relationships are going to depend on their ability to be empathetic and connect with others and not be in an egocentric place. And so the natural tendency of this stage in life is to be selfish, to, to focus on the self. And so those things we can do to really give them that level of empathy for others and point those things out can be so important. Um, one skill to be able to do that, just as a side piece, is to be able to talk to them, you know, asking questions that are what if or what else questions. So like a what if question would be what, you know, somebody else they know went through something and we ask them, what if that was you that went through that? Or what if you were them? Putting them in someone else's shoes. Um, what else could you have done? Um, what else would you have done if you were in somebody else's position? Um, what do you think they're feeling right now? Or how do you think they felt about that? It's so much safer as humans to talk about other people rather than ourselves. And so oftentimes in the work we do, we can get, if we're asking them about their feelings, we sometimes get a grunt or um, not much of anything. But if you ask them about someone else, they can of, oftentimes connect with that. And, and that's okay. If that's where we need to start. That's okay because when they connect with others' feelings, they're also simultaneously con connecting with their own. Self-control, uh, just that idea of discipline. I like to think of discipline as the ability to do things that we don't want to do, but we need to do, or to not do things that we sometimes want to do. Um, so that idea of dis building discipline into our lives, so important. And then the understanding 
having that big picture perspective of what's going on and not just getting lost in the trees for the forest, uh, but being able to see, you know, okay, this decision that I make now is going to impact all these other things down the line. Uh, that's just an example of thinking in the future. Um, but, or this, this decision that I make is going to affect my relationships this way or my roommates this way, um, getting them to think about the big picture. All right. Resilience is a term that's so popular right now. Um, I, I can't tell you how many trainings I've been to where resilience is a hallmark. And um, I just wanted to point out, because when I think of resilience, I, I used to think about it like, okay, just the ability to get through hard times, to be able to take a hit and get back up and keep going. Um, but there's a lot of nuances to this. And I wanted to point out uh, a part of this that was really helpful to me when I started looking through some of the literature around resilience. Because um, obviously resilience is just such an important factor for, for Arte, and many of them have it already built in. They've been through incredibly difficult circumstances and have come out the other side. Um, but I just wanted to point out that keeping an eye on resilience really also sets a tone for how we work with them. So three different kind of models of resilience or, or ways that we build resilience. So the first one is this compensatory model, um, this idea, and I, I put it as vitamins. So this is the idea that um, we take vitamins for the purpose of kind of boot bolstering our immunity system to be ready to make us more strong so that we don't get sick or hopefully. Um, so this would be akin to the promotive factors that we, that we set up for our, for our youth or that, that are already built within them. Those pre-existing traits and skills and qualities that allow them to thrive in the midst of adversity and risk. And they, many of them, I'm sure when you think about the Tay that you work with, you can think about many of the things that they already have, uh, that strength, that communication, that ability to read situations, whatever that might be. Um, but we can also build those skills with them. As, as we work with them, we're building some of those skills and not just in times when, when it's reacting to a situation that's happened, but it oftentimes can be more helpful to work on those skills when they're in a position to be able to learn them when they're not in the middle of a crisis. So these vitamins are also, these are developed resources and characteristics to compensate for exposure to risk and challenge. So these things that we're already building within them that hopefully strengthen them so that when they hit the challenges that we know they're gonna face, they're more prepared and more buffered against them. The idea from this model is that they less, lessen the in, impact um, because of the immunity that's kind of already been built. So the next model is a protective model, and this is more uh, akin to antibiotics. So we take antibiotics when we already are sick or are starting to get sick, and we're trying to um, respond to that, trying to feel better, trying to get rid of the sickness. Um, so this is a lot like the protective factors that we do, and a lot of our programs are really heavy in this area. Um, we're, built, we're built around um, being able to do work in crisis to help recover and to get them back on track. Um, and that's an important part of this. Um, so it serves as a defense by limiting or minimizing the full negative impact of the experience that they're going through. And I'm sure many of you do so much work in this area. Um, you get calls at all times of the weekend, the night, every, every time to be able to support them through um, different decisions or challenges that they're, that they're making. Um, the last one here is the challenge model. Uh, add a little quote in there from Kelly Clarkson's song, What Doesn't Kill You Makes You Stronger. But the idea of a vaccine is that you're actually taking a part of, of this sickness and intentionally letting it be in your system so that your body can build immunity and against that so that later you don't fully contract that. Um, and that is very similar to this model. And so I think it's important to point out that we also need to have this a part of the work that we do with our Tay. So sometimes there's areas where we can simulate or add the risk or put them in a position where they have to go through something ahead of time, but in a small way, and then they're ready more in a big way later on to go through it. And that is really important um, to be able to do that. And I would encourage you in those three models, most of the time, if you look at, the, at your style personally or the program that you work with, you might find that 
it's more heavy in one area. Oftentimes, the heaviest one is, is this uh, protective model, where we, we see these challenges come up and we're set up to help them recover and respond to it. The problem with um, being only working out of that model or heavily out of that model is that it's, it oftentimes creates a dependency where they go through things, we get them through it, they recover, but they haven't necessarily built the skills to be ready to um, handle that the next time. So then they're coming back the next time for that same support. So the, the first one, the third one um, of the, the vitamins to build the immunity against them and also the vaccine, putting in some things that are challenging ahead of time so they're more prepared. Those are parts that I would, I would like you to consider and hopefully you can maybe add that to some of the work that you do with them if you are not doing that already. And if you're already doing that, more power to you, congratulations. That's, you're a very uh, progressive program then. All right, experiential learning. So we're going into this. Um, I wanna, the picture I love personally. So this is an area, I started surfing um, later in life, later than most. Most of the people that I surf with have been surfing since they were you know, five or six years old. And so they have a tremendous advantage on me. There's a lot of fear and discomfort and things like that that I went through when I first started learning. But this picture is amazing. I wish that was a picture of me. Um, obviously it's not that person has hair, but I, I'm so, that's, I'm, I so admire that because the ability to be able to do what uh, that person is doing in that per picture is incredible. Um, the skill and the practice that that takes, the balance, the discipline that you've had to do, the, the amount of time in the water practicing, you don't just go out and do a wave like that without that practice. And you also don't go out and do that without the experiences over and over thousands and thousands of times of doing it. Um, you couldn't ever be in that position to do that by just having someone tell you, go out there and do this and then go out and do it. It's those hours and hours of experience. And the point that I'm making with that is that it's the same thing with our tag. So much of what we're trying to work on with them, um, we have to have that experiential learning going on. In addition to encouraging them, supporting them, telling them how, it's really important to be able to have, go through those experiences. So um, there's a little quote there from Benjamin Franklin that I like. Uh, the experiential learning. So here's some of the ways that we learn. And I think that Emma's gonna put up a little poll again here. What I want you to think about is what are, what are the ways um, that you most commonly teach your, your te? Um, do you lean towards certain ones of these as you teach skills and abilities? So I'm, I'm gonna have that come through as we talk about this. So go ahead and respond to that poll. Um, but the idea that there's lots of ways to learn things. So, you know, one way is to just be told how to do it. I could tell someone how to do it. Some things are easy enough where if you just tell someone how to do it, it, it can just be like that. And they can do it right away. Another one, observing. Um, being able to watch someone do something. That can be really incredible. And that's part of experiential learning is watching someone else do something gives us the the confidence and the ability to see someone do it and then feel more comfortable doing it ourselves. Um, being shown how to do it. So that, that's not just observing, but actually having people uh, show us the parts breaking down and doing parts of it with us. Um, another one is being able to be corrected. So as we're doing it, someone coming in is giving feedback and saying, oh no, this is how you do this, or this is how we do it better. Collaborating is another level of experiential learning where not only are we like being shown, we're showing them parts of it, but we're actually having someone do it at the same time as we do it. So we're doing it together or simultaneously. Um, then we have doing, which is, you know, sometimes throwing you in the deep end and you're just gonna, you're gonna do it and we're gonna work through the issues as you do it. That can be a really powerful way to learn. Um, imagining. So the idea of mentally putting ourselves in the position of doing it, and so this, is, this is true in uh, a lot of professional uh, sports and professional um, things like that when people are doing, they imagine, they, they visualize themselves doing the, doing the perfect thing and that can actually help with the skill itself. Um, questioning, asking questions about something so that we learn how to do it better. And then simulating, this is an important one. Sometimes we can't put someone in a position to fully do something completely, but we can simulate it. 
and by putting them in parts of the situation to increase their exposure to it. I wanted to just give an example early in um, my career. I, I was working with a lot of Tay who uh, were cutting or doing self-harm. And it was my responsibility as the mental health provider to help them with that, with that process. Um, and part of that was, I, I made the mistake for a long time of going through this big safety plan and, and helping them come up with a plan of, okay, when you, when you have the urge to cut, when you're feeling all these feelings, what are you gonna do differently? And you, we'd come up with some amazing things, listen to music, um, you know, take a shower, talk to someone, put myself in a position to be around other people so I'm not tempted, all those kinds of things. But what I was finding was we'd build this great plan and then the, the day we're, we're not following through with her, I come back later after they'd cut and it was, yeah, I didn't do it or I didn't think about it or, you know, I don't know. I just, I'm not sure why I did that. And what I found was that was very, very powerful was that when I adjusted and started asking them, okay, hey, when you have the urge to, to cut and hurt yourself, and I start asking detailed questions like, where are you when that usually happens? Where are you in your house or at your school? Um, you know, even like down to, are you in the bathroom? Are you in a stall in the bathroom? Are you, do you go to a certain area? What do you use? Um, and I found out more context about that situation. And then I adjusted, instead of talking about it in theory in an office, we actually went to the exact place where they were most tempted to, to cut and to hurt themselves and where they had built that habit. And in that space, we practiced um, other skills. Um, obviously there were spaces I couldn't go to, I'm not gonna go into the shower or the bathroom, but, but, but to go into the space where they are and be able to teach them, okay, when you're sitting here, when you're in that moment, what are you gonna do? And when you walk through it that way and you practice it in the moment with all those things simulated, it made it so much more likely that they were going to do it. In fact, I found that they were so much more likely to, to do the skill that we were practicing. So I see the poll results coming up now. By far collaborating, it was the biggest one that you use, which is a great form of teaching. Um, uh, be, sh being shown is also up there. Um, so there's, 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 there's responses in each one of those, which tells me that I'm talking to a group that's already doing a lot of this. But what I would encourage you to do is look through that list and think about the ones that you might not be using yet, because there's a lot of options and maybe options that you haven't yet thought of in terms of them being able to learn a skill in a different way. All right. Here's some of the times when we can, uh, we can learn skill or some of the things that the reasons why we use experiential learning to overcome challenges, build a new habit, quit a habit. So just a list there. And then the last area we're gonna go through that's so important is this practical decision-making. And um, I, I have to admit in doing a lot of presentations over the years, I've taught on a lot of different um, acronyms, a lot of different um, decision making and problem solving models. And I really was never happy with all of them. And in, as I'd used them with Tay, they weren't, um, they weren't getting to the point that I wanted to, or they, they weren't as effective as I had hoped. So I came across this one recently, and this is very recent. This comes out of a book that was really just written. And it's by a guy named Patrick McGinnis. And he's the one that coined the term uh, FOMO which we all know FOMO. Um, I think we've heard that enough in popular culture. Um, this idea of the fear of missing out, um, the idea of a focus on what we, have, what we don't experience instead of what we did experience, or th this idea that if I make one decision, I'm gonna miss out. Um, this becomes a product of, of the culture that we have right now with so many options, with constant comparisons to others, social media influences, um, the consumerism out there, and kind of a, a widespread discontentment in life um, that, that really affects um, all of us, but, but Arte in particular. Um, so he put together this decision-making model. And one of the other concepts I wanted to introduce, if you hadn't heard of it, was this fear of uh, a better option, um, FOBO. So it's a hyper-focus on what I could do versus just what I'm going to do. And this idea that no matter what decision I make, there's maybe a better option that I could have chose or wanting to not even making a decision because if I make a decision, I might be limiting the, the options or the, the opportunities that I have. And it can really be something that leads to an 
analysis that leads to paralysis, that we don't make decisions and our, our pay don't make decisions because of that. And it's a difficulty or delay in making decisions due to not want it, not, not due to wanting to maximize every option that we have, which is often impossible to do. So that's why it can be a frustrating thing. So what he did was he broke down um, decisions to help us kind of triage and make decisions about uh, the things that we need to. So the first one here is these uh, no stakes decisions. Kind of like uh, I, the example I'm giving is what to watch or stream on TV. Um, so there's no real consequences to the, that choice um, for the most part. And you don't want to waste your mental energy thinking about no stakes decisions. So in those kinds of ones, you can just flip a coin or come up with some other ways to quickly make the decisions and move on. Um, for low stakes decisions, an example might be what class to take in college or, or school. And while that can have some impact, it's not an end of the world decisions, minimal consequences often. And there's other examples you can think of. And what we do with low, with low stakes decisions is um, we identify what's most important to us. And oftentimes we can outsource the decision to a trusted other person. So if in that example I gave, what class to take, I can talk to the school counselor, I can talk to the, you know, that person and have them help guide me and decide and I can trust their decision and move on because the consequences are fairly low. And I also don't want to waste a lot of energy on that decision because it doesn't have a lot of consequences. Then there's these high stakes decisions. Um, I listed some of them here uh, that Arte may be, may be talking about or dealing with. These are ones that have significant consequences. And this is what we want to save our mental energy for. Um, so there's a list of kind of uh, rules or a structure to making this, th these decisions. And I really, really like this. And I've used this um, with a lot of different uh, Tay in this position to be able to help them make decisions. So I wanted to share it with you if it could be helpful to you. Um, so to the first step is setting your criteria. What's most important in this decision? What do I want out of this? Uh, what do I value the most? Um, then collecting the fact, facts, so gathering data on uh, what the possible options are and what I could do. Um, a lot of times in that place, we're looking at the advantages and disadvantages of those options. Um, then number three, and this is one sometimes they don't think of because they get so in black options. Sometimes we think we have to choose between two decisions and actually there's ways to do parts of both and that's the better way to go. So when we look at that, combining those decisions. Um, number four, and this is probably the most important step in the, in the process here, is establish a front runner. So I usually have one choice that I'm leaning towards that I kind of want and that I'm thinking might be the best decision, but I, I'm not sure. So that's our front runner. That becomes really important because in step five, now that I have a front runner, I compare all of the other options to my front runner. And if my front runner is still better, one, you compare them one by one, head to head. And if my front runner is still better, then I eliminate that other option. And I eliminate it forever. I don't let it come back because um, that just complicates the decision making process. Um, then what happens is once I get to number seven, I get down to one final choice um, and maybe, maybe between two options. And if I'm down to that and I still can't make a decision, I pick a couple trusted other people, usually an odd number of people, like three, and I might get their feedback and then just go with, the, go with the majority on that if I don't have a strong, if I really feel like both decisions are equal. Um, and then the eighth part is just the most important part, committing to that decision. Um, you know, and I think this, this part I put afterwards is so helpful. Um, we need to make the decision right not make the right decision. And I think that can be a real helpful way to put it for your Tay. Um, once we make that decision, we need to commit to it and we need to make it, make it work the best we can. Um, we can sometimes, when we really commit to things, we can make that decision come out to be the best decision. And that way we don't get caught up in obsessing over whether we made the right decision or not. We just made, the, we, we made a decision and then we committed to it and that, ended up when our commitment made that to be the right decision. So I found this to be really, really helpful with um, big decisions. And oftentimes the Tay we work with already don't have a process for making decisions like that. Um, so this can be a helpful one to walk through um, as, you're, as you're guiding them in, in the things that they're making decisions about. 
All right. That's been a lot of talking for me. So, so we're hitting about 15 minutes left, and this is the time that we left for um, questions and, and anything you'd like to share. So um, please, please do that, and Emma's going to convey those to me as they come through. Yes, feel free to use um, either the Q&A box or if it's easier, you can use the chat box. And then while we're waiting, I just wanted to go over a few things that we got questions about. Um, so um, we will be sending a follow-up email tomorrow um, with all the slides um, from this presentation, as well as a certificate of participation. Um, and then the link to um, this recording. It is being recorded, so it'll be put on our website. Um, and then if you are interested in CEUs, there will be a follow-up survey that'll pop up after this webinar ends. And once you complete that, then it'll send you to a page to register for CEUs. And let's see, I don't have any questions yet, but we'll give it a couple more minutes. To... While we're waiting on that, um... Just wanted to, I did list some references at the end. Most of these are, are books that um, are hot, are, would be very helpful um, as you work with the Tay population and they cover the, the range of, of things that we, we talked about today. So I just wanted to point that out if any of those are helpful to you, um, as well as the exercises uh, that we used being able to, to use those uh, with your coworkers and with your youth, um, as well as the video that we sent you a link for. Perfect, thank you. That was one of the questions if there were resources to share with clients. So, great. I see a lot of thank yous. Thank you. Yes. Oh, um, we did have one. Let's see. Um, in regards to self infliction, what is the best thing in regards to safety or to help someone overcome this? Yeah, that's a really hard one because as we know now, um, self-harm becomes um, addictive um, because it is uh, releasing some of the same chemicals and neurotransmitters in our brain that, that drugs do and it can become something that is a pain reliever even though we're causing pain to our cells when we self-harm it can actually serve the purpose of numbing both physical and emotional pain so i think some of the most important things to do in that situation is to really listen to um, the the tay that you're that you're working with um, because oftentimes there's nuances and differences in what purpose that self-harm is serving for them. Um, for some, it can be making them feel alive when they're kind of feeling numb and dead inside. Uh, for others, it can be um, something that's actually relieving pain for them. Uh, for others, it's a habit. For some others with deeper trauma, sometimes it's a form of them punishing themselves for things that they feel uh, guilty over or responsible for. There can be a lot of reasons for that. And once you pick up on what it is for them, then oftentimes that dictates how we're responding to it and how we work through it. And, um, you know, obviously we want to, um, youth that are hurting themselves, that have suicidal ideation, that do self-harm, we of course ideally want them working with um, a mental health professional, somebody who can really do a good assessment of their safety and help give them those resources. Um, but as someone myself who, who is in the position of doing that, um, building a safety plan, building a realistic safety plan, making sure that they have individuals and groups around them that can, they can talk to and support them, um, making sure they have connection to a mental health professional, um, and then following through on the safety plan, like we talked about in the presentation, that's the most important part, not just building one that ends up being a piece of paper or a conversation that you had that they verbally committed to, but really practicing the skills that you set up in that safety plan and getting their permission for you to let other caregivers, friends, others be a part of that safety plan for them so that there's some accountability there. Perfect, thank you. We do have some more um, popping up here. So let me see, uh, let's see. We have one that says, I understand this is a more general webinar, but I'm wondering how these different approaches can be used for black transitional age youth or LGBTQ plus specific transitional age youth, um, since generally these are more vulnerable and underserved populations and need more support and even just reaching out. So are there kind of different approaches you would take? Yeah, and that would, that, I mean, some of that is a whole nother area of training in terms of cultural sensitivity and 
um, the social justice pieces of, of everything that's going on. But I will say that uh, most of my work has been with um, at risk um, populations, minority populations, um, underserved populations. So this is built off of that, that group. Um, and so the things that we talked about in here are very relevant to that group. Um, but for specific situations, obviously you named some of those LGBT, um, black youth, other, I think that it's really important that we do do those cultural sensitivity uh, trainings and development, making sure that we're aware of, of some of the things that, like for instance, um, just a, a generalization, this isn't true in all cases, but many minority groups um, can be, have an adverse reaction to going to formal therapy or being involved in that, they, they may like to keep things in-house within the family or maybe within a faith community or using the people that they feel comfortable with. So um, we, we need to be aware of that and be sensitive to that as, as we work through it. Also, if we don't share the same um, ethnicity or background or culture as the person that we're working with, which many times we don't, probably most of the time we don't. Um, and even when we do, we need to be aware of their uniqueness and their uh, individuality and, and not make broad generalizations or sweeping assumptions about how they operate based on what we think, but really listening and trying to understand where they're coming from. So I'm sorry that has to be general, but to get more specific, it would probably require a lot more time and a training. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, our next one was, how would you suggest helping the youth define no stakes decisions, low stakes and high? I know I've had experience with Tay youth feeling or believing a low stake decision is a high stake decision. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and it goes back to the very first uh, exercise we did with the squares where oftentimes we see it one way and they see it a completely different way. And it's not about us trying to you know help them see the right way it's about understanding why they see it a different way and really helping them explore that um but it really breaking down the, the decisions and this what stake decision it is um it really is about exploring their perception of what the consequences of that decision are and helping us to maybe share some of the consequences that we might be aware of of decisions that they might not be thinking about because once you're thinking about the consequences of decisions then you're able to decide, okay, is there really no consequences to this? Is there minimal consequences or is there high? Um, so if there's disagreement in that area, it really is just about the dialogue and helping share some of your perspective of why consequences for a decision might be higher or lower and listening to their opinion about why that is and, and hopefully coming to some compromises and having them learn from what they hear from Great, thank you. We have a couple more. Let's see, the next one is, how can I get the non-minor dependents to participate and stay in compliance in Tay while also trying to meet their case plan goals for self-sufficiency? <laughs> That's a really specific question and one that I, I deal with and I, I hear a lot. Um, in part, I wanna be humble with that question and say, if, if I knew the answer, um, I, would, I would have a real gift that I'd be able to give you and I'd probably have a, a different job to, to be able to do. Um, the, the truth is, is that's the struggle we're, we're really in is, is trying to balance the compliance, um, balance their individual goals and oftentimes those don't completely overlap. And I think um, it's important for us to acknowledge that. It's important for us to talk about, talk to that with our supervisors and managers and coworkers. And it's important to be real with our, with our Tay about the idea that sometimes we have uh, things, agendas or things that we have to meet, criteria that we have to meet that may not go along with their plan. And I think that's the, probably the most important part is open and honest communication about that. Because if we're kind of trying to uh, pursue an agenda in secret or, or without be full disclosure to them, that can sometimes feel non-genuine to them. But if, if we can say, well, this is on my end, this is some of the things that I, ha I have to make sure that we show outcomes and that we, we do this. And, and I have to balance that with your needs. Um, being honest and open about that is, is the, best, the best way. But how to do that perfectly, I think we're all still trying to figure that out. So I just want to encourage you that we're all still figuring that out. Thank you. 
Um, we have a couple more. Um, how can I approach a youth who always um, seems to have excuses on why they're not doing a particular thing um, and someone who refuses mental health services? Yeah, so many of them are in that position. Um, I'll answer the second part of that first. The mental health services can be a really difficult one. Um, one of the things that it is important to talk to them about is they oftentimes have had experiences with, with mental health providers that were not good ones or that were at times that were, there was a very turbulent time in their life where they were maybe forced to do that and that wasn't a good feeling. Um, if you're able to talk to them about the variety of mental health services and the fact that some people don't sit on a couch for 45 minutes and just talk to you verbally. There are people out there that um, do art therapy, that do equine therapy, that do music therapy, that do movement and dance therapy, that are, are doing all kinds of creative things. And if we're able to hook them up with individuals that kind of fit their needs and make that feel better for them, then that can sometimes be a helpful one. Um, and then the question just went away, so I didn't see the first part of that, if you could put that back up. Oh, but, I'm sorry. Uh, that, can be, that can be hard. The other, the other um, successful thing I've had is, is sharing with them how I've uh, been involved in mental health services. And I don't know for all of you out there, if you have had that experience, I would encourage you to do so just so that you can have the experience on the other side of the couch. Um, but being able to tell them, hey, at times in my life, I've been able to go through this and it was incredibly helpful and this is how it helped me. It creates a vulnerability and a connection to something that they might be scared or uncomfortable with um, that may pay dividends, but some of them refuse anyways. So I know I answered the second part of that question. I didn't answer the first, but um, I, I don't have it up in front of me right now. So Sorry. Yeah, it was just, um, so how would you approach the youth who seems to always have excuses about why they're not doing a particular thing? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, excuses are a big one and they're going to come. And I think that really goes back to a couple of things we talked about today. What, what driver's seat are we in? Um, if, if we're in the driver's seat, then they're oftentimes going to um, have us controlling those decisions and making excuses that for, for things that they didn't choose. So really putting them in the driver's seat and us in whatever role they're needing us to be in at that point, um, but helping them to make those decisions and empowering them to do so. And the excuses are gonna come, they're gonna be there. Uh, I think once we acknowledge that, we don't get as frustrated with them because it's part of their, uh, their, their process of taking accountability for the choices that they make. Um, but the excuses can be rough and that's when we go back to some of the compassion fatigue stuff that we talked about, really reminding ourselves that um, we don't have to control that. We don't have to have them stop making excuses. We just have to do the best we can to guide them through that process. Great, thank you. And then I think we'll, we only have a few minutes, so we'll do this one last question, and I think it's pretty relevant to the times. Um, so what has your experience been supporting you through technology, and how has that been challenging? Yes, it has been. Um, you know, I know every program is different. I know a lot of people are providing uh, virtual services, virtual therapy, case management, all those kinds of things. My particular program um, is because we work in a residential setting, we are in an essential uh, service that so we've been doing still face to face with with the physical distancing requirements with that. So we haven't dealt with that as much, but we have dealt with it more in our um, population that has graduated from our program and are out there in the community. And um, we're right now, right in the midst of doing that very thing, trying to collect the contact information, do the best we can to connect with, with those Tay, figure out what their needs are. A lot of them have lost jobs, have lost housing. Um, we're, we're trying to support them and figure out what the resources are out there. So, um, you know, it's a whole different world trying to connect with them virtually and doing that. They're, they're oftentimes more skilled at it than we are. My staff um, have, have, <laughs> is still having to get used to using that um, platform to be able to connect with Arte. So yeah, it's, it's different times, but I think it's all, it's pushing us all forward and it's gonna make us better in the end and more prepared to deal with them in whatever way we need to. Great, well, thank you. Um, that about ends our time. So um, I did put my email in the chat box. If anyone has any outstanding questions, you can email me and I can get you in touch with Rex or get you, get you some sort of answer um, to whatever question you have. 
Um, so yes, thank you everyone for being on. Just another reminder, a survey will pop up um, after the webinar. If you could please fill that out. Um, we use that information to give to our funders and to provide more trainings like this one. Um, and then thank you so much, Rex, for being on today and for giving all this great information. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. And thank you for all that you do for our, our young people. All right. So have a good rest of the day, everyone. Bye.